Hey folks, welcome back to the show. This is your host, Ryan Kennedy, and today's episode, we're gonna be discussing detoxification and how to really make changes to your environment, to your living space, and to your day-to-day choices to minimize your exposure to tens of thousands of these different toxic chemicals and different compounds that have made their way into our food supply, into our water supply, and into our into our homes and the products that we use. And so I'm joined today by David Getoff, who is a real pioneer in the natural health space and a personal mentor of mine. I've learned more from you, David, than probably anyone else when it comes to holistic health and how to help people get well. And so I'm really excited to dive into this because one of your specialties is detoxification and actually doing it correctly, which is not the case when it comes to most people talking about detox and cleanses and whatnot. So I'm really excited to share some practical strategies with everyone today. Uh, David is a certified, board certified traditional naturopath and clinical nutritionist. He's a fellow of the American Association of Integrated Medicine. Um, David, you have so many accolades and credentials. I'm going to go through a more. The mo- uh, most updated. recent, most recent one, by the way, is I just got certified as a metabolic health practitioner through the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners. Oh, fantastic! And, and, and everybody should, everybody that's interested in in eating well should uh, um, watch, or if you're local, go to one of the Low Carb USA conferences. Uh, there's San Diego Low Carb USA is going to be in August. Okay, and you should go. Yeah, I've yeah. been a couple years back, and yeah. it was fantastic. Uh, David's developed and produced over a dozen educational holistic health DVDs uh, on topics including cancer and heart disease, diabetes, and of course, detoxification, which we're talking about today. And his uh, new book, Abundant Health in a Toxic World, is absolutely fantastic and goes into a lot more depth than we're going we're going to cover today. So definitely check that out. You can find it on Amazon to learn more about you know, nutrition. And I did an interview with you, David, um, you know, about a year ago, Mm -hmm. a little more. And that's where we talked a lot about nutrition and, you know, different fallacies about fats and saturated fats and cholesterol and, and statin drugs. So I encourage people listening in today to go back to that interview to learn more about those topics that we covered in our first interview. Um, so let's dive right in today, David. Uh, let, let's start at the top in discussing why detoxification is important. Well, um, I wonder how many people listening to us uh, will never clean any part of their home, okay? They never clean their kitchen, they never clean their bathroom, they never clean anything else because why, why, why bother? Especially because it's just going to get dirty again. Yeah. So there's no sense in having you or your family or the cleaning crew, if you're hiring somebody, to come in and clean your house because it's just going to get dirty again. You're going to have to do, do, it, do it again. And your house is more important than your body. Huh, Really? Uh, no, my body is more important than my house because uh, uh, my house not here. I still want to be alive and being enjoying things and being around somewhere. So the reason is because if you think that the substances that your house is exposed to that get it dirty in whatever ways you mean dirty, you know, uh, where you can put your hand across the counter and you can see that there's some soot or dirt on there or whatever. If you think that that is anywhere near as detrimental to your home, which it is not, as the chemicals and poisons that you're exposed to, both in your home and as soon as you walk outside your door, and the fluoride and the drinking water and the chlorine, the chloramines in the drinking water and all the toxic substances that are in your, oh, your shampoo and your conditioner and your body lotion and your toothpaste, uh, and all the things that are in our air outside, so pesticides, herbicides, uh, fungicides, you're exposed to and absorbing all sorts of things that your house is not absorbing. They're just sitting there. Somebody can clean it off with a rag, and it looks clean. We're absorbing them. They're going into our tissues. Why do so many people get cancer? Why do so many people get all sorts of autoimmune diseases? Why do so many people get neurological diseases? Those are all caused by poisons. Uh, so heart disease is predominantly caused by your diet. Uh, cancer is caused by both diet and poisons. Uh, but neurological disease, autoimmune disease, those are predominantly caused by poisons. And so if you think about going back however long you want to go back, 5,000 years, 10,000 years, whatever, you know, pick a number. How many of the poisons are we exposed to today? How many of those? 
uh, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, uh, the uh, additives that are in our food. How many of those existed 5,000 years ago? I would guess extremely few of them. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, basically none of that group. Yeah. Uh, there was lead and mercury in the earth and stuff like that. Sure. Uh, but none of the uh, additives, additives, we didn't have refrigeration. There was no additives. You killed something or you picked something and you ate it. Where'd the additive come from? Who put it in? Yeah. Nobody. They weren't trying to make it last longer. So most of what we're exposed to today wasn't here. Therefore, our body's main detoxification abilities, which are your kidneys, unless you gave one away and you only have one kidney. <laughs> so your kidneys, your liver, uh, your breath, we do breathe out poisons, and your skin. Those were never designed. I don't get into who designed us. I'll let everybody else <laughs> argue about that. Yeah. But whoever it was that did or didn't design us or evolution or whatever, uh, we were not designed to be able to detoxify things that didn't exist. And so we are now filled up with all these different poisons that are the reasons for numerous different conditions. And our body's ability to get rid of them uh, is so tiny and further restricted because the organs, kidney and liver predominantly, that are supposed to help us do that uh, are massively toxic because nobody's ever done anything to help them. And I think that's a great analogy with the house and also a really important fact because a lot of people will say, they'll say, oh, our bodies were built to detoxify. And it's like <laughs> uh, not the 80,000 plus synthetic chemicals that were never around throughout human evolution that have entered the you know, environments in fa fairly recent years, you know, within the last couple hundred years that these things have really become predominant that we never used to have to deal with. So never our bodies are not prepared for that because they weren't around before. So And, and, th and those of your listeners that go, yeah, but come on. I mean, this stuff comes in and goes out and comes in and goes out. I mean, how many chemicals are there really in your body? Well, fantastic organization, big watchdog nonprofit, EWG, the Environmental Working Group, EWG.org, did two unbelievable studies, one in 2003 and one in 2008, if I remember the years correctly. Uh, the first one, 2003, was called Body Burden, the Pollution in People. Uh, the second one, a number of years later, was called Body Burden, the Pollution in Newborns. And you'd have to go to EWG's website. Um, back then, it was like posted right there. There's the study. Now they've got so much information there. You actually may have to call them and say, how do I get access to those PDFs to watch them? I should call them up and find out if they'll let me put them on my website. But, you know, because they're, they're copyrighted studies. But they wanted to see what kind of chemicals were in people. And uh, we know, well, we being the people that know, <laughs> uh, that the vast majority of poisonous substances bind more readily into fat cells. And so if you want to see what kind of poisons are in somebody, yeah, you know, you could take saliva, you could take blood, you could take a urine sample, a stool sample. Uh, but those are things that you're getting rid of. You really want to see where it's locked up. And so what they usually do is they do a punch biopsy of fat cells. So they take something and they take some fat out of one of your buttocks. And they wanted to see how many things they could find, but they wanted to look at a lot. And what a lot of people don't understand, it's very interesting, it's very different than our eyes. When it comes to biochemistry, you can't find something you're not looking for. Because every single test, if you go to uh, HACH, H-A-C-H dot com, they are, make a lot of test equipment uh, for testing for fluoride and chloride and all these different things, chloramines. You need a different instrument with different chemicals to test for this chemical and a different one for that chemical. and Because somebody has to figure out what you have to mix together that will show you a color change or something uh, as there's more of that chemical in there. So they wanted to look at hundreds of different chemicals. They couldn't find a lab that could do that. So they start calling up all these different laboratories around the United States, and they still couldn't find a lot of the things they wanted to be tested for. They couldn't find the ability. So they ended up contracting with labs in, I think, three countries. Um, so a couple of labs said, yeah, we should be able to develop a test to test for those three pesticides and those four herbicides, but we haven't done that yet. And they said, we'll pay for you to develop the tests. So it ended up that they sent these fat biopsies from the 12 people that they tested in the body version of pollution and people test uh, to, I think it was seven different labs in like all three different countries. 
and some could test for these 25 and some could test for those 30 and this and they ended up testing if i remember correctly for about 165 different poisonous substances and they found over 60 in every single person and some of the stuff they found like ddt had been outlawed for you know decades and it was still there wow and so anytime somebody says well but really is this stuff in us those are still the two definitive studies and the second one was done because the question was is mom putting poisons into her child before the child is born? How do you test that? Well, you test that by, at birth, taking a section of the umbilical cord and sending it to each of those seven labs and saying how much of these poisons were already inside, these toxic chemicals were already inside this, this, uh, this, this infant. Um, you know, the instant it's born, and they didn't just come in now in the delivery room. They've been going in there because the body uses the fetus as a toxic waste dump. Anything that's coming in, it shunts some of it into the fetus. Wow. And, you know, it's not doing that on purpose. That's just the way things work. It's one more place to get rid of it. You know, we're trying to get rid of it through urine, through the kidneys, uh, through stool, through the liver, through, you know, breath, through skin. Uh, and here, here's another, here's another d a dump site we have with the fetus. Yeah. So they did that one and they go, oh my God, take a look at all the chemicals that are in before you're even born. So yes, it's a problem. Yeah. And it amazes me that people are um, more diligent about cleaning their house and their house is not gonna get cancer, is not gonna get heart disease, is not gonna get an autoimmune disease. Yeah, it might get so dusty that maybe if you're, you're reactive to dust, you'll be sneezing a lot, but it's not gonna die of what's in it, that you're cleaning it every week or every two weeks or once a month or however you do it. You could die of that or just for the last 25 years of your life feel like crap the whole time and be on all sorts of drugs suppressing symptoms of things that you might have been able to prevent if you had kept your detoxification systems working well. And I had one woman that I was treating for a while that I said, how about your husband? Because usually if I'm treating somebody, I ask them about their spouse. And her answer was, I asked him about having him come in to see you so we could do some things. And he looked at me and he said, honey, I don't do prevention. If I get sick, I'll go to the doctor. And I said, really? He said that. She said, he did exactly what I just did with you. He came into my face and said, I don't do prevention. I said, do me a favor, but please tell him it came from me. I am not trying to get you in a big fight with your spouse. That's not the way I work. Yeah. Tell him it came from me. Tell him you told me that. And what I said was, and which I'm going to you know, say to you right now, uh, actually, that was a lie. He does prevention all the time, multiple times a year probably. And I would like to know why his automobile is more important than his body. Because nobody changes the oil on their car because it started to stop do something correctly. Never, that's never the way it's done. They changed the oil on the car because the manufacturer has said, in order to prevent problems and have your engine last longer, you change your oil every, when I was a kid, it was every 3,000 miles, then they moved it to four, then they moved it to five, seven, and according to the oil analysts I've spoken to, that's not because the cars are better. That's because the EPA and the government doesn't want all this oil coming out, and so they raised it up and so all the mechanics that I know that are really, really care about their cars and like me, keep them forever. My car has 317,864 miles on it because I needed to write that on AAA uh, form yesterday. Um, and so the people that know, they continue to change their oil every three to 4,000 miles, even though the manual says every 6,000 or 7,000 or 8,000 because they want the car to last longer. Mm -hmm. And I said, so ask him why he cares more about his car, that he's doing prevention on his car. And she said, I like that, I will ask him. So when she came back for her next appointment two or three months later, I said, did you ask him? She said, yeah. I said, what was his answer? She said, he looked at me and said, huh, you're right. You're right, I have the oil changed, that's 100% prevention. Um, yeah, I guess I care more about my car. <laughs> that's, that's, absurd. that's absurd and it is fascinating I remember learning the, the studies you referenced from the EWG from you years ago and the cord blood one especially so it's um, highly important people do 
proper detoxification before they start to get pregnant. Exactly, but not during. Right, correct. Because not that during. can cause even worse problems uh, with their you yep. know the outcome of their pregnancy. I always tell people spend one year. It's not as long as it takes, but spend one year for both partners doing detoxification before you try to get pregnant. And people will say, well, but I'm already, pick a, you know, pick an age, yeah, yeah. you know, 28, 31, 32, everybody has their own age. And, and, and I'm getting older all the time, and, and the older you get, the more likely you are to have a problem with your pregnancy. And I go, no, 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 wrong, wrong. The older your body gets, the older your biological age, not your chronological age of when you were born. If you work with me for 12 months, all of the biological testing that can be done, you will now be three to five years younger than you were a year ago. So you're not hurting that, you're mm -hmm. making it better. Yeah, that's an important distinction. And so you mentioned a few of the chronic illnesses or diseases people can get from this body burden of toxic chemicals. What are some of the symptoms? And I, I know your answer to who should be doing a detoxification protocol is anyone with a beating heart because of the <laughs> things you just shared. But when it comes I to- I taught you well. Yeah, when it, when it comes to symptoms, what are a few things people experience uh, day to day if they have a particularly high burden of these chemicals in their bodies? Well, for some people, as our toxic load you know, goes up, uh, their sleep gets worse. Uh, their ability to sleep gets worse. Um, their uh, for, for for men, uh, people have all sorts of prostate issues. Mm -hmm. Very often, that's different chemicals are causing that. Uh, somebody's eyesight starts to go because of all of the things that are causing aggressive harm uh, to all sorts of different things having to do with your eye. Uh, skin problems of all sorts of different types. Uh, uh, lack of energy. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, uh, you do exercise all the time. That's your thing. I do much less exercise than I should, uh, but I'm also stronger than almost everybody else 10 years younger than I am because of detox and eating correctly. Yep. So that doesn't mean the exercise isn't something I should be adding in a lot more of, sure. but, but they're all different. Yep. Um, but in many, many people, so, so for example, there's an old phrase of uh, my cup runneth over, uh, or the standard one is the straw that broke the camel's back. Yep. You know, um, and so what happens is very often somebody says, I don't have any problems. And I go, so you are on no prescription or non-prescription drugs. Oh, no, I'm on the drugs the doctor put me on. Oh, and he put them on. He put you on them because you have no problems. Really? So it's amazing how many people are on one or more over the counter or prescription drugs that think they're healthy. Mm -hmm. And no, healthy people don't need drugs, yeah. you know. Um, but in many cases, it's again, it's the straw that broke, broke the camel's back. So there are people out there who feel totally fine. Uh, they do the things that they need to do. They have their occupation. They take care of their house or their spouse or their self or their kids or whatever. And if I said, what problems do you have <clears throat> that somebody would say are associated with health? Some small percentage of the public might say, I can't think of any. I go, okay. How many people do you know, either friends or family, that are no longer here or still here because of cancer, heart disease, or diabetes? So they may have died of it or they may still be here. And if I'm not talking to a five-year-old, they're going to be able to name some different people. Yeah. I said, how would you like to get one of those conditions? And they look at me like, what are you, stupid? Of course I don't want to get those conditions. I go, well... Did those people slowly become diabetic? I go, no, all of a sudden they had an issue. They went in, they found out they were diabetic. Okay, so we often don't know what's going on in the background as these toxic substances are causing damage until all of a sudden something isn't working correctly and we go in, they run a bunch of tests and they go, oh my God, you have fill in the blank. You know, uh, a tumor we have to take a look at, leukemia and lymphoma, uh, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, al Alzheimer's, some other form of dementia. I mean, I could keep on going. Yeah. Um, and up until that point, they didn't know they had it. So a lot of people that think they're fine, they're nowhere near fine. And if we ran a uh, GPL tox panel to see what kind of poisons are coming out in their urine, uh, if we ran a heavy metal toxics on urine or stool or whatever, we would find all sorts of things that the research studies published in mainstream toxicological journals 
will tell you what it is doing in your body that you don't yet know about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a really important thing to understand because a, a, just because you don't have a diagnosed chronic disease doesn't mean you're you're healthy. Right, and it doesn't mean it's not coming. It doesn't. It doesn't mean it's already not manifesting. You know, people will go in and get their hemoglobin A1C tested, and it'll be really far from healthy. But they aren't at that one threshold that's required to then say you actually have diabetes. That's a fact. My my two of my favorite tests, even though there are no tests that show you everything, are hemoglobin A1C and albumin. Uh, albumin is overall immune function, and the doctors were not taught that. Uh, but if somebody's albumin is, most cancer patients, their albumin is below 4.0. And again, we're in the United States, so if somebody's watching this in another country and they're using metric numbers, I don't know what those ranges are. Yeah. These are U.S. numbers yeah. I'm giving. So uh, below 4.0, I see a lot of cancer patients. And where do you like to see it? Like above uh, five? I, like, I like to see the albumin. I'd love to see it above five, but I've seen that three times in 30 years. I have albumin above five. Uh, fantastic. Okay, that's four times in thirty years. Yeah, you know, and I do, but but you don't usually. Yeah, uh, I like to see the albumin as much above four point four as I can slowly get it as people start doing better and better. The average I see is four point three and four point four. Okay, and if we do all the right things slowly over a period of six months, a year, or whatever, pull poisons out, maybe we'll go up another tenth of a point. And a tenth of a point on that test is a lot. Mm -hmm. Just like on the A1C that we'll go over for a second. Yep. So, you know, 4.4, 4.5, 4. If somebody has 4.5 or 4.6 on their albumin, they are better than most of the public. Okay. Doesn't mean they may not have other problems, sure. but that means they have a good bounce back ability. Somebody has a, a 4.1 and somebody else has a 4.6 and they both get in the exact same auto accident. And the 4.1 has an infection and dies in the hospital and the 4.6 recovers and comes out and is fine. So that's, that's a really good one. And the hemoglobin A1C, which is HA1C, which is also called glycosylated hemoglobin or A1C, um, 5.7 is called prediabetic. So the lab test will say healthy is below 5. It doesn't say healthy. It says normal, yeah, which yeah. is not healthy. Yeah, yeah. Normal is, and then it has a less than sign, 5.7. So less than 5.7 is normal. So if you're 5.6, then the doctor won't say a word mm -hmm. because you're normal. That's like you driving, you're on your way to, let's say, from San Diego to Los Angeles, and you bought this stupid car that somebody designed that lets you know you're out of gas. So you look down, it doesn't say you're out of gas. So you know you're fine. And then all of a sudden, the engine stops, you're coasting to the side, and the light comes on that says you're out of gas. That's pretty stupid because I want a gas gauge that tells me that I'm yep. starting to go out of gas. Yep. Well, that's what the A1C is. The A1C is telling you you've got a problem. So a really healthy A1C uh, would be uh, below five, mm -hmm. you know, 4.9, 4.8, 4.7, whatever. Uh, I've seen that probably 10 times in 30 years. Uh, and one of them is mine and yours, yours may be below that also. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, most people's A1C that I see is... 5.3, 5.4. And remember, 5.7 is diagnosed pre-diabetic medically. Mm -hmm. So that's an indicator. And if somebody is 5.5 or 5.6, I will look at that and I'll say, you will be diabetic within the next two to five years. Mm -hmm. You know that from my test? How come my doctor didn't say that? I said, because your doctor doesn't know that. Mm -hmm. And I have people come in with a 5.7 or 5.8, which is legally, so to speak, it's not a law, pre-diabetic. And it says it right there, you know, 5.7 and above is pre-diabetic until it gets to diabetes. Mm. And I'll say, okay, did your doctor say you were pre-diabetic? And nine out of 10 times they go, no. And I go, well, you're pre-diabetic. Let me show you this. And I show them where it says above 5.7, pre-diabetic. Mm -hmm. And you're 5.8 or 5.7 is pre-diabetic or 5.9 again, above 5.6 actually is pre-diabetic. Why didn't my doctor, if I'm 5.7 or 5.8, and that's pre-diabetes, according to the chart that the doctor handed me a copy of to give you, why did the doctor not say I'm pre-diabetic? I go, because pre-diabetes isn't a disease. He can't treat you. Or if it's a woman, she can't treat you because it's not a disease. Until it becomes diabetes, they can't treat you. So they don't know what to do with that thing saying that you're getting there. Mm -hmm. I know what to do. 
Yeah. I'm going to have you change your diet and it'll go away. Yeah. If they put you on the diet they were taught about in medical school, or they have their registered dietitian put you on the diet that she was taught in dietetic school, you'll continue to get worse, maybe even faster, because it's all wrong. Yeah. And so they don't tell you anything. And then we work on, I love reversing diabetes on people. Yeah. But, you know, all of those things. But, but uh, one of the things in de detoxification that the more knowledgeable health, pra health practitioners and doctors have wrong is they were taught, for example, if they want to look for heavy metals. So somebody's learned about some poisons and they're looking for these particular toxics. They want to look at arsenic and cadmium and nickel and lead and mercury. And so they do, one person does a blood test. Somebody else does a stool test. Somebody else does a urine test. Well, blood test is the worst because the body does not want to hold those poisonous substances in your blood. It sequesters them out and throws them in other areas. So if somebody has a blood test that shows high lead or high mercury, for an example, because those are two main ones, that means they have a current exposure. They are currently, whatever they're doing, maybe they're eating tuna fish, which is very high in mercury. Maybe they're eating shark, which is 10 or 15 times higher in mercury. Oh, yeah. You know, a whole bunch of different things. But they are currently exposed. Because if the last time they had an exposure was three months ago, the blood will look normal. It's already sequestered it out into your cells, and it's sitting there hurting you, increasing your risks of all sorts of neurological problems, and it doesn't show up to the doctor, and they don't realize that. But if they do a urine or a stool test... Sometimes it's called a challenge test because they'll do one to see how much of these things are there. And then they'll give you a chemical that helps to grab onto these toxic metals. And it could be EDTA, DMPS, DMSA, D-penicillamine. Uh, it could be uh, zeolites. And they give you a bunch of that. And then depending on which chemical it is, they wait you know, either a certain number of hours or days or whatever. And they do a second test. That's called a challenge test. They challenge the body to see, okay, if I start yanking on these things, does your level go up in the urine or in the stool? And if it doesn't go up, they were told, well, there's no problem. And it's not a lie, because if you don't know you're lying, you can't lie. It's just a really cute one. It's always my dad in my, in my ear. Mm -hmm. Don't you use words incorrectly. Mm -hmm. If somebody thinks they're telling the truth and it's 100% wrong, they weren't lying. They were ignorant. They didn't know the truth. They said something that was wrong. But if they thought it was true, it wasn't a lie. You have to know you're lying in order to designate it a lie. So they then take a look and they go, you know, I thought based on your symptoms and your neurological problems that I was going to see high lead or high mercury when we did this challenge test. Uh, but it's the same low levels that, that were in your, your urine or stool, you know, without the challenge chemical. So I guess I'm wrong. Not true. Yeah. And the experts that are out there have taken people and they've sometimes done the challenge test three or four times or five times, or they've put them on chelating substances. Chelate means to bind. That's mm -hmm. when you're pulling something out. Uh, and they, they test them you know, once a month for a year and things go up and things go down and things go back up again and down again. Well, that shouldn't be possible if what they were taught was right. Everything would slowly go down. You keep on pulling, it should keep on going down. But nope, your biochemistry changed. Now your body says, okay, I can dump a bunch of mercury this, uh, on this particular urine sample. And it goes way up. So we cannot know what is in anybody short of a test, which I never recommend to anybody because it can only be done during an autopsy. <laughs> yeah. That's and that means, so if somebody wants to know how many poisons are in, you know, brain, kidney, liver, whatever, uh, during an autopsy, they can take that organ out. Uh, they weigh it. Then they put it in basically a Vitamix and, you know, mash it up. Then they take a certain amount of that and send it in to a uh, organization that has a mass interpolating spectrophotometer that is looking for lead, mercury, arsenic, whatever. You see how much is in that amount. You multiply it by the amount that they weighed the entire organ was, and you see at time of death how much of all those things were there. Yeah. But otherwise, all we know is what comes out that day. So I will never stop detoxifying because I know the stuff is always coming into me, and so I want it always coming out of me. Hopefully it's coming out at at least the speed, if not more, that it's coming into me, because I don't want any of those conditions that I'm treating. Yeah, and one more question on the testing, because one test that I see done pretty commonly for heavy metals is a hair analysis, mm -hmm. a hair metals uh, and mineral analysis. Right. 
And would that also be a pretty worthless test based on what you're sharing, like the blood and urine, or is that any better? To, to me, it would be worthless. Okay. Uh, because um, what they do is they, they take a hair sample and they cut off all of the ends of the hair. They only take the first inch mm -hmm. close to your scalp. Uh, or sometimes it's pubic hair if somebody doesn't have any hair up here, or beard hair or whatever. Sure. Uh, and that gets sent in and it gets burned into an ash uh, because that doesn't get rid of the, the chemicals. And, and then again, it goes into uh, an analytical mass interpolating spectrophotometer and they take a look. But again, the amount that is in there is the amount that was slowly being released into your bloodstream and was there being, therefore being supplied to your hair follicle and getting into your hair. So if for whatever reason in your body, most of it is being locked into the cells, doing its damage and getting ready to cause you X, Y, or Z disease, and it's not getting into the bloodstream, then it won't be there. So if you see something, then you know it's there. If you don't see something and you've been alive for a while living on this planet, not in the middle of a rainforest, I know it's still there. Yeah. So some, some of the positive or high results would be indicative there is a problem but there's a lot of false negatives so to say lots and lots of false negatives Got the it. purpose that doctors use to run this number one is because they think it's giving them information that it isn't which we just explained mm -hmm. and number two sometimes it's cya okay which is cover your ass oh. uh you know that's <laughs> yeah. they 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 want to put somebody on a detoxification chelation program and inject them with or give them oral things that bind and they don't want somebody to be able to sue them and saying, why did you charge me and give me all these things to bind something that wasn't there? Mm -hmm. and so they're doing the challenge test, hoping that they will see something come out and then there's a reason to give them these chemicals to bind. What they don't understand is that there might not be anything coming out and the person's still loaded with chemicals. Yeah. So. Bottom line, don't waste your money on testing, testing. folks. Yeah. Just know that detox is going to tremendously benefit everyone that's living on this on this planet in the modern day and age. Yeah. And if you want a really good book on mercury and fish and intoxication, um, it was uh, written by a uh, medical doctor, Jane Hightower, and it's called Diagnosis Mercury. She did a very good job because like lots of professionals, she had somebody come to her with all sorts of different problems, wondered what these problems were caused by, you know, ran all sorts of tests, found out it was mercury, and that made her go, oh, what, mercury, why do you have too high a mercury level in your body? I think uh, the wo woman was eating tuna. She starts looking into this and says, oh my God, there's massive amounts of research of mercury in the fish and of the damage it does. Why, why is this not coming out to the public? She tried to get it out to the public. She got stopped all the time because of our government agencies that don't want that to happen. Mm -hmm. So you get to see, and there are lots of other books with different poisons, uh, but that's a really, really good one. And it's available for people that like audiobooks like me. It's available from audible.com if you want to listen to it. Okay. But yeah, Diagnosis Mercury, Jane Hart Hightower. Great good job. Know. Okay, so another really good one is Science for Sale by David Lewis, okay. a top EPA scientist finding poisonous substances that he tried to get people to know about, and the EPA shut him down. So those are two books for people that think that if we knew about this stuff, it would be brought out to the public. Read those two books and you'll know why it's not. Makes sense. So I want to come back to detox, but before we get there, you know, it's almost counterintuitive or working an uphill battle, let's put it like that, if you're doing all this great detoxification with, you know, high quality supplementation and other lifestyle practices, yep. but yet you're constantly retoxing with exposure to these things right. in very high amounts that could be minimized Absolutely. Uh, and, and avoided to some extent. And so I want to discuss how people can make changes to their environment, to their inputs, um, food, water, air, otherwise, to really minimize the amounts of these toxins they're being exposed to. Sure. Um, so from my understanding, the main sources of environmental chemicals would be the food we eat, yep. the water we drink, yep. the air we breathe. <laughs> uh, what else is there? <laughs> there's there's the, a couple the things others. we put on us. Yeah, the personal care products that we use on our bodies, like right. makeups and lotions and, and so on. Yep. Uh, the household products, right. whether they be cleaning supplies, whether they be household items and building materials. Yeah. And then as well. Yeah, po um, polishes and waxes yeah. and all sorts of stuff. Some good ones, some bad ones. Yep. yep. And then obviously pharmaceuticals are a big one. But oh, we'll big one. Kind of yep. steer clear of those because that's individualized and hard to make right. recommendations yes. on a broad well. level. Yeah. So I want to start with food. Okay. You know, so what are some of your top recommendations? Um you know, in addition to always choosing organic, I think that's something a lot of people, at least my listeners, will understand the importance right. of to minimize their exposure to pesticides, to right. buy organic produce and organic grass-fed meats. Mm -hmm. yep. um, 
but going beyond that, what are some high level tips or some of the top strategies to minimize your exposure to these things? With I would I would intake? put the organic as number one. Okay. Um, and, and a lot of people will say, oh, I found this study that says organic food doesn't have more nutrients in it. Well, actually, that's a bad study because there's lots of studies that show organic food does have a lot more nutrients. But don't eat it because of the additional nutrients. Eat it because of the massively less amounts of pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. That's a good enough reason because they yeah. accumulate in your body. Yep. So that's a really, really, really big one. Some people will go, for example, to the EWG website and take a look at their list, or Consumer Reports has one also, of their list of those fruits and vegetables that have been shown to have the highest amounts of these. And I go, so in other words, you're saying that um, uh, you can hit me, but don't hit me harder than this. Yeah. And I go, no, no, just try to eat organic as much as you can. Now, sure, if you look at those lists and you find that there's a couple of foods that are super, super high, uh, strawberries, you know, because they're on the ground, sure. so much more insects on them, so you spray them with more pesticides, and you happen to like strawberries, then you can either say, let's see if I can find a fruit that I like better that is not that bad, you know, maybe an apple or an organic blueberry, or let's say, okay, when I buy strawberries, they're going to be organic. I can't afford to buy everything organic. Uh, I don't have people buy strawberries because they're too high in sugar, and because I like berries that if you cut them with a sharp knife, the inside is the same color as the outside, because mm -hmm. those were the original ones that are much higher in nutrients. The original strawberries were pink or red inside. Now they're all white inside. Yep. So uh, organic, absolutely big, 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 big thing. Uh, filtering your water, you know, another big thing. If you can get yep. some kind of water filter on there, there are lots of good ones out there. Uh, Aquacera is, is the company I've been dealing with for 35 years, but they're, uh, it's not the only company. Uh, and you want some good quality charcoal, you know, bone charcoal, catalytic carbon, and you want a company that can give you an independent lab analysis that proves of what it's taking out. Because there are a lot of companies out there that say, oh, it does this. And I ask for the independent lab analysis. Oh, we can't afford to do that well, then I'm not going to buy your product. Mm -hmm. I want to see how much it does. Because very often, the companies will not fail their product. I saw a shower filter, for example, that they said that their shower filter removed chlorine for 30,000 gallons. And I said, wow, uh, what do you have in there? And they told me which type of charcoal was in there. And I said, how much? And they told me the amount. I said, there's no way that'll remove a decent amount of chlorine for more than like, 10,000 gallons. How do you list it as 30,000 gallons? When do you fail it? Well, we fail it when it when it lets through 50% or more of the chlorine. I go, no, 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 no. No, I want it to be able to take out 90% or more. I want it to fail if even 10% is coming through there. So you have to know what they're doing. So everybody lies for marketing purposes. So I sure. want to you know check things like that. And of course, if you can afford a whole house filter, you know, that that's great. Yeah, too. one note on that that a lot of people don't understand is you know, people tend to realize filtering your drinking water is important. Uh, a lot of people use garbage ones like Brita, which are virtually worthless. Yeah, very little um, charcoal in there. Yeah. yeah. So, so Aquacera being a great one, that's, that's what I personally use as well. Um, but we absorb so many of these same chemicals in a shower, in a shower especially a hot shower. It opens up your pores and now the steam is turning some of these chemicals into a gas state. Yep. And so you're breathing, breathing it in. in. Yep. So getting something, whether it be a whole house filter, which would be an optimal option, uh, or a shower head filter uh, is immensely important. Immensely important. Um, yep. What what shower head filter do you typically recommend for people if they can't afford the whole house? Or if you're just it? trying to get one that's reasonable, um, that removes mostly chlorine, uh, rain shower, uh, is, rain shower. Is, is, is one of the decent ones. The biggest problem is you have to find out from whoever it is you pay for your water. Do they use only chlorine or do they use chlorine and chloramines? Because the regular charcoal pretty much doesn't pull out chloramines. And so what, what I do is I buy the uh, um, it's a 10 inch housing, which normally you wouldn't have a big housing like that on your shower. <laughs> Those would be under your kitchen sink maybe. I buy a 10 inch housing, I have a plumber put that in, so the uh, shower arm that comes out, which you know is bent and has a shower head on it, that gets removed and the plumber puts in a straight arm and puts this on instead, and then the shower arm goes at the end of that. And I put a cartridge in there that's called a uh, Aquamedics. The Aquamedics is a special type of charcoal that uh, Aquacera sells, and it's a 10-inch cartridge, 
and that pulls out the chloramines and the chlorines and even reduces fluoride a little bit. It's just a much, much, much better char uh, cartridge. And that's something you make yourself or do they sell that on their website? Um, I've never seen it on their website. They sell the cartridges and people put them in other other areas. Got it. But, you know, I just uh, tell somebody, you know, buy a standard 10-inch cartridge at Home Depot or whatever, or maybe your plumber has them if he does water filtration and have them put that one in instead of the little one. But yeah, but, but that's big and ugly. I said, you entertain in your bathroom? Yeah. <laughs> You know, I yeah, don't care yeah. what it looks yeah, like. Yeah. I care about my health. And if you care what you look like, you're going to want to filter your shower water so you don't have all this, these skin issues oh, and hair issues. Oh, your skin and, is a lot happier if yeah. chlorine and chloramines are not going on your skin all so the time. So if you care about looks, care about the look of your body, not the look of your, your shower because that's what's more important. Yep. Um, and for, for example, most people clean their houses with substances that the antibacterial agent in there because everybody's afraid of bacteria. We shouldn't be. It's you know good for us to have exposures to it because then we develop a better immune system. Mm -hmm. uh, so many of the cleaning things have either ammonia in them or chlorine in them, both of which are very toxic, aerosolize immediately, and you're breathing them in. So you're trying to get cancer, uh, to get asthma, to get chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, every time you are working with an ammonia or a chlorine-based product. And of course, you put the two together, you get a toxic gas. Yep. Uh, so I, you know, we have somebody that comes in and cleans our house, a couple, uh, and I give them what I want them to clean the house with. Yep. And I actually ask them, does anybody else give you non-toxic products? And he said, not only does nobody else give us non-toxic products, not only do we, you know, sometimes get headaches at other people, but most of the people that we clean their houses for, and I don't have a prejudiced bone in my body, but we're next to uh, Mexico here. So there's a lot of Mexicans in the area. And this is from them. This is not me. This is them. He said, especially the Mexican women, if they don't smell chlorine after we've cleaned their kitchen or their bathroom, we're fired because they only think we've killed the bacteria if they can smell the chlorine, they don't understand that they're hurting themselves. And there's been lots of research done on this stuff, and you don't need to use any of those things. Nope. You can just clean it with soap and water. Uh, they clean their house and my house with a small amount of vinegar in the water, and all the surfaces I give them my products for. Um, the uh, solutions for you and treatment and other different things you can you know put links on your site or whatever yeah, yeah. some of the good for ones. anyone listening in actually I've created a whole document which I'd be happy to share with you to pass along to people you work with that links up all of the best household cleaning products I've learned from you sure. you know that are non-toxic that actually work because mm -hmm. a lot of these you know laundry detergents or whatever it is they may not do a very good job even if they're you know, non-toxic. So you want it to do a good job. Right. You want to do a good job and be non-toxic. Exactly. Right. So I've linked up a bunch. You could always email me for that list. Um, but coming back to the food before we get more into right. the so organic stuff, number one. Yep. Right. Organic number one. Now, obviously people are going to want to avoid a lot of processed foods for a multitude of reasons, but also because of all of these preservative chemicals and additives that right. extend the shelf life that make them more profitable for the manufacturers. But absolutely terrible for our health. Also, if, it, if it's not growing out of the ground, so now we're talking about things that can, you know, walk, fly, swim, whatever. Yeah. Uh, what did it eat? Yep. People don't understand that if you want to be healthy and you want to eat things that are healthy, you can't be eating something that's healthy if what it ate wasn't healthy. So in addition to organic, you know, I want grass-fed birth to death, grass-fed mm -hmm. and grass-finished beef, Grass-fed and grass-finished lamb, grass-fed and grass-finished bison. I just got a quarter of a bison a couple weeks ago. Um, you want uh, wild-caught, low-mercury fish. So, I mean, those are other different things that are not organic because you can't get organic fish. Yeah. You don't know where they, where they were. They can't yep. certify that organic. Uh, but I want it to be wild-caught so it doesn't have all the crap that they're adding in to make the fish grow faster. Yep. Uh, and I want it to be a low mercury fish. Yeah. I actually have on, on my website, I've got a, a fish and mercury chart somewhere. It's an amazing uh, resource. Top right side, it says, uh, I think it says additional resources, drop down menu. And there's one of recommended products that has lots of cleaning and salves and all that stuff and uh, the mercury list. Yeah. Yep, davidgetoff.com to find that folks. Cause that fish chart is tremendously helpful to know what fish to eat versus avoid. And as a general rule of thumb, the larger, longer living fish that are, you know, higher up on the food chain have accumulated more garbage. So those are going to be ones to avoid. Now, on the topic of fish, yeah. if someone decides they want to eat fish and even cleaner fish are going right. to have some degree of, some, of heavy yeah. metals and toxins, yep. can they consume a binder 
like zeolites or chlorella along with that fish to minimize the amount their bodies absorb? Theoretically, um, since it will be touching it because they're both going down your gastrointestinal tract, yeah. theoretically, if you are consuming some chlorella uh, tablets or capsules, uh, and many of them have been found to be contaminated and loaded with mercury, so the ones I recommend are made by NOW actually, Now Foods, Now Foods Chlorella, they test all their chlorella. So even though it's a less expensive company, uh, their chlorella products are often better than the more expensive ones. Mm -hmm. uh, so sure, taking a bunch of those with, with the meal. Uh, but again, that's going to bind some of it. Taking some zeolite, you know, ACZ nano spray, taking a bunch of those sprays a couple times that day that you're going to do that. I mean, those will all help bind charcoal, bind some heavy metals. So, you know, you could take a, a, a teaspoon of a really good activated charcoal or a bunch of charcoal capsules. Um, but I would prefer just not to, I'm, I'm what, you know, you're playing with fire. Yeah. You know, you're, 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 you're teeter tottering around in, in a way that, that I don't like. Sure. If somebody says, well, but if I like tuna fish. I go, well, if you just found out that something you like was going to give you cancer or diabetes or heart disease, or in this case, an autoimmune condition or a neurological condition, uh, might you decide, it's not the only thing I like. Yeah. There are lots of other things I like. Lots of other good But if you say, well, sometimes I'm going to have tuna, okay, and, I'm going to, and I like tuna fish salad. All right, so my recommendation would be to either use Safe Catch brand. That's the one I've got up there. It's a mm -hmm. Safe Catch yep. uh, because they test every fish. Uh, or to go online with Vital, V-I-T-A-L, Choice. Uh, their, their stuff is all, is all low mercury, mm -hmm. and use those instead. Uh, sardines, if you like sardines. Fantastic. Uh, you know, Wild Planet sardines, very low in mercury, and very, very, very high in omega-3s, so great for you. I use them as an earthquake food. I always have a few cases of sardines, and after they've been like five years old, I start eating them and get a few more cases. But... Um, yeah. Yes, there are binders that you can take that can help, but I want to do more than that. I would rather say, what else do I like just as much that isn't bad for me? Yeah. And one other thing on the tuna front, for people that do like tuna, there's so many varieties of tuna and they're not all created equal. And right. what I've read is skipjack tuna mm -hmm. is one of the varieties that are lowest in mercury. Whereas when you get these big, you know, yellowfin or, you know, la larger tunas, they, they start to become a lot more problematic. Well, the, the size makes a difference. Yep. And so the better places that have the low mercury tuna use line caught fish mm -hmm. instead of net caught fish where whatever comes in goes. Yeah. This is so much better for our environments as well because all the net caught fish tends to be, you know, have a lot of this bycatch that's really harmful to our ecosystem. Yeah. Um, okay. Anything else you want to share on food before we come back to the water? No. Uh... You know, obviously we covered food and all yeah. the other stuff in, in the last one that, that, on that they need to go listen to. Yep. But uh, yeah, yeah, organic is, is great. Mm -hmm. If you can't get organic, non-GMO is a poor second. Okay. Because non-GMO means that whatever they were feeding, whatever you're eating, uh, was non-genetically modified. So in other words, if you've got eggs and it says, you know, non-GMO, then all of the feed that the chickens got was not genetically modified. But it could have been loaded with poisons, could have been loaded with pesticides, herbicides, fungicides. I mean, organic is what says both of yep. those. Yep. So I would rather organic. And for, for eggs, I wanted to say organic pasture raised. Mm -hmm. And one thing on the water, just to wrap up that, yeah. uh, you're, I mean, we could do an entire episode on water because you have so much you could share. Well, I've got a five or six page yeah. article on water on my website. That's an excellent resource yeah. for people to check out. But I think it's important to note as you bring in these filtration mechanisms that are freaking really helpful – to also remineralize your water because you're going to lose out on some of the minerals. That only, only for reverse osmosis. So these no, no, no charcoal filter removes any minerals at all. Okay, so there would be no need to use a trace mineral product. No, trace minerals are because there aren't enough trace minerals in our food. Okay, and so we're bringing more in because we're deficient for that reason. Sure, but the charcoal filters of all the different types, even the really good ones like Aquacera, uh, they've put things in that will bind uh, lead and mercury, but none of the healthy minerals. They go right through it. Great to know. Great to know. Okay. Reverse, reverse osmosis pulls all the minerals out. Yep. Distillation, which nobody should drink, uh, pulls all the minerals out. Those, you'd need to add stuff in. But with charcoal filters, no. Great to know. Now, moving on to air air purification. Right. Um, you know, what what can you share there in terms of helpful strategies um, along with a, you know air purifier that you recommend to people you work with? Well, the, the most important thing is to understand that no matter where you are, unless they are currently tarring the roof across the street, 
or asphalting the road, you know, outside your house, or somebody's out there spraying pesticides, you know, because the exterminator is there, unless that's currently being done, the air outside is cleaner than the air in your house. Mm -hmm. So the people that close all their windows to keep the good air in are not doing the right thing. The good air is outside. Yeah. So you want your windows open whenever you can have them open. Obviously, if it's super hot outside and you got your air conditioner on, okay, fine. But just remember, your air, which is captured, all of the stuff that's coming out of you know your, your, your paint, your varnishes, uh, your uh, uh, press board, which uh, outgasses urea formaldehyde, uh, anything that anybody's used, uh, whether it's a, a toothpaste, a body lotion, all of the cleansers that you've used, that have different things in them, that's all captured inside your house. You want as much fresh air in there as possible. Yep. Uh, as far as air filters, I've been looking into a whole bunch of stuff having to do with air filters because a couple a couple of technologies that switched over from one company and I found that a company that I've been recommending wasn't really making them. They claimed they were, they weren't, they're buying from somebody else. Mm -hmm. So it'll be a couple of weeks before I will be able to give you a specific thing. So there's one one product, so for example, behind us here, which I turned off so that it wouldn't be on the recording, is the IntelliPure. The IntelliPure is a fantastic air filter, uh, and the company that was carrying it went to a different one. Well, but the company that makes it still makes it, and mm -hmm. so that's one of the ones. So I'm about to change the area on my website that goes over air filters to a couple that I'm now looking into and I want to make sure I validate them before I put them on. So I can't give you the IntelliPure, absolutely fine. Okay. Uh, and then there are a couple others out there and I'll, I'm going to put them together. Great. And then what about houseplants? I've read that they help to pull things like formaldehyde and benzene and other chemicals out of the air. Is that Houseplants absolutely do that. The okay. research was done by NASA mm -hmm. uh, and there's an entire book written just about that. And it's a title is something like uh, Making Fresh Air or something. There's a house plant on it. Of all the different house plants that they studied, <clears throat> the one which they said did the most, which doesn't mean that, you know, you, I mean, I like lots of different plants. Sure. Uh, but the one that did the most is Chlorophytum, which is a spider plant. Yep. And so that's a, a nice plant. You know, uh, you get the variegated one with the green on the outside, you know, white in the middle. Uh, they send out runners, so they do well in hanging baskets. Uh, but yes, having plants around is definitely a, a good thing to help make your air better. And yeah, I actually have an article on my website about that from the, the NASA Clean Air Study. Mm -hmm. The 18, I have like an infographic of the 18 house plants they studied. That they studied, yeah. That they said are, you know, the best picks when it comes to air Fantastic. purification. So Excellent. people can go but there. But I love, I love plants. I mean, we've got, what, four plants in this room. I've got a ponytail palm and I've got a uh, Ming tree, Polycius fruticosa. And I've got a sense of area, and yeah, I just like to have plants. Yeah. I, mean, I like living things around me. Yeah, it brings in good energies yeah. as well. Now, last last thing I want to touch on in this section is the you know household and personal care products. You know, we touched on a little bit about the cleaning products. When it comes to personal care products, people don't realize the onslaught of chemicals they're oh. putting on their skin, which get absorbed <laughs> transdermally into their bodies right. from all of their makeups and lotions and shampoos and conditioners and sunscreens and toothpaste and you know the list yep. goes on and on deodorants yep and so uh what are some tips for people to kind of look out for when it comes to making good healthy choices well the most part? important thing to understand is that more and more drugs are being made transdermal um, because they find that instead of somebody having to remember to swallow something uh you know they can just uh, take a patch and throw it on your arm and it slowly releases X, Y, or Z pharmaceutical into your body for whatever it might be, eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours. Uh, and none of those transdermals require you to shave off all your, all your hair, poke a bunch of holes or rough it up with sandpaper. No, you just put it on. So when somebody says, oh, how much goes through your skin? Enough that it can be used as a drug delivery system. Yeah, a lot. So lots. Yeah. So uh, the standard ones, which have been you know, known for years and years of causing all sorts of problems, are methylparaben, propylparaben, sodium lauryl sulfate, uh, polyethylene glycol, polypropylene glycol. Those are antifreeze. Mm -hmm. And so I just want them gone. I don't want them in any of my, my substances. It's very hard to find products, personal care products, that don't have any of the chemicals I want in them. I mean, really, very, very hard. And the companies marketing is marketing. Marketing is them trying to tell you why you should buy their product. So it will proudly say, 
no parabens. And I'll take a look, and it's got five chemicals in it I don't like. I mean, I'll go to a show, and those big thing that says no parabens, I said, let me take a look at your label. No, we don't have any parabens. Let me take a look, let me take a look at your label. We don't have any parabens. And I always, I always joke, I always say, do you know what doesn't matter to me? And now the salesman has my interest, right? He wants to know what, because he wants me to carry his product. He says, no, what doesn't matter to you? What doesn't matter to me at all is what isn't in your product. Because it's not in your product. Why should it matter? Yeah. I only want to know what is in your product, so give me the blasted label. I want to see what's in there. And so it's got three other things that I don't like in there. And then they change the name. So sodium lauryl sulfate is listed in lots of places on problems for further study, things that we know it does to animals, but it's still legal. So now it says sodium lauryl sarcosinate instead of sulfate. It says sodium laureth sulfate, a big one which I see a lot of now, is they give you some plant that you're used to that they derived it from. Mm -hmm. So sodium lauryl sulfate, parentheses, extracted from blueberries, mm -hmm. extracted from coconut oil. So my question is, and I'll often ask the person, oh yeah, but we get that from blueberries. I go, let me ask you a question. Let's say, okay, let's say that we analyze blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, a bunch of different berries, and we find that they have small amounts of all the chemicals that we also find in rattlesnake venom. But because of all the other nutrients that are in there, they don't cause us problems when we eat them. How about we extract all those toxics from those and we make a rattlesnake venom that was made from strawberries, blueberries, you know, mangoes, whatever. Is it okay if I inject that into you? Rattlesnake venom? No, it, but, but we made it from those things. So always remember, it doesn't matter where something came from. It only matters what it is. Mm. Very important. Yeah. And so we take a look at all those. So it's very, very hard. So Corinna Organics is the company that I carry a bunch of products from. Mm -hmm. uh, their stuff is really, really clean. Uh, I won't buy something that has caramel color in it. Even if it says natural caramel color, which you get from burning onions, because that same burnt onion caramel color has been used in experiments where they topically put it on mice to cause skin cancer. So, you know, natural, plus of course, natural has no meaning in the United States. No, it does not. You know, maybe in the future, yeah. you know, it has in other countries, but in the United States, you can put in lead, mercury, arsenic, pesticides, you know, whatever, and there's nothing in any ordinance that prevents them from saying 100% natural on the label because natural isn't a legislated term. Mm -hmm. So forget about, every time you see the word natural, disregard it, and don't even look at the front of the package. The front of the package is advertising. Find the word ingredients. You may even find the word that says other ingredients. Yeah. And take a look at anything that has ing other ingredients. If the word ingredients is there, that's what you're looking for to see what's there. And that's a great note that I don't think a lot of people realize is when you look at the back of a bottle, it'll say active ingredients, and then it'll say other, other ingredients. or inactive ingredients. And right. they're all the ingredients. They're all active. You know, they're all in there. So it's important to look at both of those lists because the active ingredients will only list like one or two things. And you'll find the long list of all sorts of other additives in the other ingredients section. The, be the best example of how much we're being lied to was released to us only about a year and a half ago by Professor Eric Gael Cerellini. That's the scientist in Italy who did all the work that made it possible for Monsanto to get sued and for and one to get one against them uh, because of all the cancer causing effects of Roundup herbicide. Um, and he's the one that had pictures of tumors hanging off the mice in his feeding study. Um, what he found, which again, this was just about two years ago, he released this to us at, a, at the Environmental Health Symposium. And it's like, oh my God, I, that, this one I hadn't heard before. Everybody is saying that the bad thing in Roundup is a chemical called glyphosate, mm -hmm. which I've heard pronounced and mispronounced a thousand different ways. Yeah. But they said it's glyphosate. So glyphosate is bad. Glyphosate is bad. Stay away from glyphosate. Get tested for glyphosate. So he wanted to see, is that really the bad chemical in, in Roundup? Because the Roundup says active ingredients, and it tells you what percentage of glyphosate. And then it says inert ingredients, and it's the rest. So as an example, just, yeah, I don't have a label in front of me. It says glyphosate, you know, 20%, inert ingredients, 80%. Mm -hmm. 
doesn't tell you what those are. It just says inert ingredients, 80% and 20% glyphosate. So what they did was they purchased some 100% purified glyphosate. It's a chemical that you can buy from chemical companies. And they mixed it up in a, let's say, 20% solution or whatever the percentage that was that was used in Roundup. And they sprayed a whole bunch of tomato plants with it. Uh, and none of them died. And he went, this is very peculiar. So they sent in a couple of samples of Roundup to some top labs to analyze it. And they found all sorts of toxic chemicals in it. Very high levels of arsenic. I mean, all sorts of toxic chemicals in it. And the only chemical listed on the label is glyphosate. Wow. He said, so all of those other toxic chemicals, they're allowed to put in and call inert ingredients, even though these toxic chemicals are not inert in any way, and they're not required to release them to you. It's a proprietary formula. So then they made up their own solution with a similar amount of what was in one of the Roundup products, because he said there are like 700 different Roundup formulas. He made up that amount, and he showed us the slides, uh, you know, on the screen, of sprayed with water, sprayed with Roundup, and the Roundup ones are all dying, sprayed with glyphosate of the same amount of Roundup, and none of them are dying, and sprayed with all the things that were hidden under the term inert ingredients, and those are dying. Without any of the glyphosate. Right, no glyphosate. Wow. Yeah, that's something right. that people don't understand. Because right. glyphosate takes all the, it, it's all the publicity. Everyone's all the publicity is on glyphosate. glyphosate, but it's really just one of many, many like things that are in things. there. So right. how bad is glyphosate for us? I have no idea. Yeah, you know, we need some more research done on glyphosate by itself. Mm -hmm. uh, but all I'm saying is, when you see something, and it has a fair amount of inert ingredients, so it doesn't say, you know. 20% of this, 15% of that, and then down at the bottom it says, you know, 1.2% inert ingredients. Okay, I don't know what they are, they're not going to tell me, they're not required, but you take a look at something, and the inert ingredients portion of this product, whatever it might be, pesticide, herbicide, uh, is like 20% of what's in there, 30% of what's in there, 80% of what's in there, and I've seen that. I've seen on pesticides where active ingredient, 1.5%. Inert ingredients, you know, 98.5%. Wow. And now after that, I go, oh my God, crap, I don't, I don't even know what to think of. Yeah. So he, he, I was about to get to the question and answer microphone, ask him a question, but he already knew what people were thinking. He said, so we decided we needed to see if Roundup was the only company doing this, that Monsanto was the only one. He said, so there, there are thousands of, of pesticides and herbicides and fungicides in there. He said, I'm a scientist. We haven't tested them all. But every one we tested, the most toxic substances in there were not listed. So therefore, they were put in and listed as inert ingredients. Wow. That's absolutely absurd. Yep. Well, moving, moving on to detoxification. Yeah. So can you explain the first step to beginning a good detox and you know, why you support the main organs, the kidney and liver, uh, before you do any heavy metal chelators or any other types of detox strategies? You always start with kidney sure, and liver. Sure. Absolutely. So... You go into a house and you don't realize it, but the uh, pipe going from the bottom of the toilet where it hits the floor, going out to the sewer, uh, is clogged. It got clogged but, you know, between the last time it was used and now. You, you don't know that. You flush the toilet and all the water comes in, but since it's clogged and it can't go anywhere, it just raises up in the, in the toilet. And usually one flush doesn't overflow. And you go, well, I remember sometime that the more water pressure helped the more water. So you flush it again. Nope. Now it's all over the place. Yeah. So what's the problem? Is the problem that the toilet isn't working correctly? Because a lot of people will say that my toilet's not working. Your toilet's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. Yeah. The pipe is clogged. Mm -hmm. So where are the poisonous, the poisonous substances? Where are the toxics that we have in our body? Where do we want them to go? Uh, I want them to go out in my breath. Sure. I'd like them to go out through my skin if I'm sweating. Uh, exercising or in a sauna, that's a detox. But the majority of the things I want them to go out in my urine and my stool, because I get those get done every day. Yeah. And, and most of the <laughs> most of the public is constipated and they don't have an elimination a couple times a day. They eat twice a day and they have an elimination one or two times a week. Yeah, most and, people are eating four or five times a day. And right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. You know, and, and you should actually have an elimination as often as you eat. So, uh, but in any event, I want my kidneys and my liver to be working correctly. Before I do anything, 
that's going to mobilize poisonous substances from my cells, from my tissues, and bring them into my bloodstream to be filtered out by my kidneys and liver because I'm going to further overload the kidneys and liver and I might cause a problem that I'm trying to prevent. So I always begin by putting people on kidney support and liver support. I never use the, uh, the label directions because for many people it's too hard and too forceful. So it may say X number of tablets and I may you know, start them on you know, a third of that and after a week we go up a little bit more and a week we go up a little bit more. Uh, elite alternatives.net is a nurse in San Diego that wanted to set up a website for people that listen to interviews I've done uh, or read my book or whatever and they want to be able to get some of those detox agents with my directions. Mm -hmm. So she supplies them to the public with my directions and the companies, including a couple that don't allow the public to buy anything. Mm -hmm. It has to be through a health practitioner. They agreed since they're going out from a nurse with my written directions to allow me to do that. So that way they're available for people. People can buy the kidney and liver tablets or kidney and liver drops, whatever, you know, from kidney her and, sport, and be able yeah. to do this. But number one, you said, what's, what's the order? The order is kidney and liver support first. Now, if somebody has a really big problem with one of those organs, uh, somebody is getting close to being on dialysis, I probably won't touch their liver at the beginning. I'm going to support their kidney for a couple of months until I can see their numbers that are used to take a look at that are improving before I also start to do the liver because I don't want to further overload a really, really bad organ. Mm -hmm. But with most people, if there isn't already an elevated problem that I can see from a lab, then I will start on both at very low amounts and slowly go up. And I say, if you notice anything, anything you don't like, which normally for detox, when it's done faster than the body wants, is increased fatigue, you know, the person's more tired, uh, headaches, um, uh, horrible smelling stool or breath, but of those, those I don't mind because those are poisons coming out. Yeah. So that's okay. Yeah. But, you know, headaches, don't want fatigue, don't want skin rash. The body says, okay, I can't cleanse it fast enough that we're trying to, we're going to throw some of it out through your skin. So any of those things that are uncomfortable and you don't want, that means you're going too fast. Go back to the lower dose. And they go back to the lower dose and instead of staying there for a week, they stay there for two or three weeks. Okay, try to go up again. Still a problem, okay? Go back and stay there another two or three weeks. Go up at a speed that your body says that's not a problem. And once we get up to at least three quarters of what your target dose is, which varies depending on the product, then I can start bringing in substances. Uh, the one I use most often at the beginning is called gentle drainage. Mm -hmm. um, and people start taking that, again, a low dose, directions you know, that I wrote out are on her sheets. Uh, and now we're mobilizing the poisons from your cells, ushering them into your uh, uh, circulatory system where they get filtered out by your kidneys and liver and they get purged out. Same procedure. You go from two drops to four drops or one drop to two drops and you go, geez, I didn't have any problem with one drop. I don't feel good with two drops. Okay, your body doesn't want you to do that. But we're going up slowly, so we're not hurting anything too much. Go back down to one drop. Stay there a couple of weeks more. We always want to do it slowly. And then I just start going from detox agent to detox agent. You know, I've got like 45 different agents that pull out different ones. And the company I like best, uh, Professional and Complementary Formulas, they have products that most of them have names that give you an idea of where the poisons came from. Mm. So like it might be called um, lawn and garden detox mm. because it's pulling out pesticides and herbicides and fungicides. It might be called sick building detox because it's pulling out a lot of chemicals that outgas from things and in, coming into our body. Uh, industriox, industrial chemicals. Uh, plus, of course, they've made a bunch of special ones for me because I wanted to target specific things. So I had to make me a Roundup detox, a Malathion detox, a DDT detox. Because, I mean, I have people and, you know, the people that are listening to you and watching this, that you could go into YouTube and you could put in DDT spray in trucks and you can find some of the old videos from the commercials that were done back when I was a kid, you know, in the 50s and 60s when DDT was legal and they didn't know how bad it was. And the way they were proving, this is it's, it's disgusting, the way they thought they were proving to the public in the commercial that DDT was safe was by having a pesticide truck sm throwing out big, huge clouds of DDT onto the streets with children running behind it in the clouds. 
You see how safe it is? No, all I see is that you're an idiot throwing all these things on people. And did you first expose people to it and check them after 30 years to see how many more people got cancer that were exposed that weren't? No, no, now we know those things. That's the biggest problem is a lot of poisonous substances are slow as to getting to the point at which they cause the problem that we see. Yeah. And so, you know, if somebody wonders whether putting a tack in their leg is going to hurt, well, that's real easy. Mm -hmm. Of course, the second it starts to go in, it hurts. But if somebody wants to take a look at asbestos, cigarette smoking, um, mercury, lead, all these different things, uh, pesticides and herbicides, it took years and years and years and years for it to get to the level that it caused somebody to get a disease that killed them 20 years early or that they were alive, but they feel like crap and wish they weren't alive. Mm -hmm. And so you, then you've got to study people in different areas that weren't exposed to that to see, do they have a lower level? So we have a country where we don't do what we're supposed to do. Yeah. There's something called the precautionary principle. And that says, if something might be a problem, let's not release it until we studied it. We don't have that in the United States. All of the manufacturers are allowed to come out with any chemicals that they want to, no matter how horrible they are, and maybe 30 years later we find out, oh my God, they never should have come out. It's terrible. And a couple of things I wanna highlight that you shared yeah. is that detoxification, when done correctly and optimally, right. is a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Right. You know, all these five day, 10 day cleanses, they're not gonna help you much. It takes time to pull these things out. And what a lot of people will say when you start feeling this Herxheimer reaction, this detox symptoms. Oh, this can't be good for me. Yeah. Well, no, some people will also say it, it is good. It means the detox is working. It's a sign that shows it's working. Right. Health professionals will say that. Exactly. They'll say, oh no, that's okay. Yeah, they call the person. Oh no, and it's good that you feel that yeah. way. That means it's working. No, 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 no. If, if, if you have somebody that weighs too much for your deck and the boards start to creak, and somebody says, yeah, that means that they're, that they're working. No, it means that they can't support that. Yeah. So if you see a detox symptom, that is your body, that's your gas gauge, that's your idiot light saying, whoa, I am being hurt, slow down. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I think that's really important for people to understand, not just to try and muscle through it, but to understand it's gonna do potentially more harm than good, right. and you're better off slowing down and going low and slow. Right. And then the other thing is with the kidney and liver support, one thing I learned from you that I think is worth sharing is that your liver enzymes that most people look at for liver function, ALT and AST, right. won't be out of range unless your liver is so toxic and right. so underperforming right. that I think you shared with me before, it means it's like the, the organ is uh, like at 30% capacity or something along those lines. Yeah, that's what it looks like. It looks like by the time they get above what's called normal. Mm -hmm. So if the doctor says, yeah, we're having a liver issue, or with BUN creatinine or EGFR, we're having a kidney issue. By the time they get out of the range that they call normal, that organ is probably 70% not doing its job as well as it should be. Wow. And so even if your labs come back within range, you'd still benefit from liver and kidney support. Right, and that's because the doctor was taught that that's where your numbers should be. Mm -hmm. The doctor was never taught, and by the way, the way we get these ranges is by taking a whole bunch of people in the public that don't have a diagnosed illness, are not taking any drugs, and we take a look at where all these numbers are. So it might be that 20% of those people uh, were gonna have liver cancer three years from now, but right now they have no problem, and 10% we're gonna be on dialysis in 10 years, and so all they know is right now they seem to be fine. And there, it's, it's like the idiot light, it does, doesn't let you know you're getting there. And so I want them to be much less than that, but basically I just disregard those. I say, you're living in an industrialized area, mm -hmm. you're not living in the middle of a rainforest, mm -hmm. and of course if you're living in the middle of a rainforest but you were born in America, then all those things that are in the body burden, the pollution in newborns were, are in you and are still there anyway. Mm -hmm. And so yes, we. but plus, People say, well, but I've seen a seven-day cleanse, a 10-day cleanse, you know, a 30-day cleanse. How about those? And I go look at it this way. If we have the ability, which we don't, you know, some snazzy equipment that we'll never have, 
Uh, like I said, you can do it during an autopsy, but I don't recommend that. So we know how much of all these different chemicals, let's say 150 different chemicals, even though there are more than that, uh, are in your body. And somebody developed a method, whatever that would be, that if you took this pill once a day for 30 days, it would clear out 90% of that. What would that pill do? That pill would kill every single person over 25 that you gave it to. Because if you could take all the chemicals that took 25 years plus nine months yeah. to get into your body and remove 90% of them in 30 days, we overloaded your body so much, you're dead. Yeah. So it's okay that it takes a long time. It just, you know, is you're doing something for a long time. Yeah. And, and one thing I think is worth sharing as well is a lot of people who are overweight and have weight loss resistance, they're having trouble losing body fat despite eating well, despite moving and exercising. It's because their body stores a lot of these toxic right. chemicals. Screw up the their atomism. metabolism. Yeah. yeah, it screws up their metabolism. It screws up their hormonal system. But there's also a reluctancy to mobilize the, that body fat because it releases all these toxins. Right. And a lot, of, a lot of overweight people, not all of them, but a number of them, because I've had many that they go on the healthy diets that we put people on. The weight starts coming off and they're yep. thrilled to death. Yep. But then there are some that say, I guess I'm going to be fat for the rest of my life because every time I go on a diet, I feel like crap. And I go, we can change that. No, I've tried four different diets and I always feel like crap. I go, we can change that. How are you going to change that? The reason you feel like crap is because as you start to lose weight and as the fat cells are you know, going away, they're releasing all of the toxic substances inside them and overloading your kidneys and liver. Yeah. If we do, and again, I don't know the particular person, two months, three months, four months, six months, eight months of kidney and liver support first, and then you do start your diet, now those organs can handle what's coming out. And they're always amazed because a lot of these people have tried dieting four or five times. They don't want to be so big. And it doesn't work because, I mean, it, it does work. They start to lose weight and they feel like shit. Yeah. So, you know, they do this and they go, wow, you're right. The weight's coming off and I feel totally fine. Yeah. And one of the biggest current, uh, I'm not even sure what words to use on it. That is, that is going on in, in America. It may be going on in other countries, but I'm sure it's, it's here. One of the biggest disservice would be the word. One of the biggest disservices that we are currently doing is we're calling overweight something that's totally fine. And don't talk about somebody being overweight. That's fat shaming. Yeah. And I'm sorry, we have a condition, overweight, which is very well known and very well proven to massively increase your risk of numerous diseases and screw up your health. And we can't talk about it because it's fat shaming? Give me a frigging break. You know, all the studies that have been done on a whole bunch of different conditions find that the overweight people are more likely to get them, and more likely to die from them, and all sorts, but we can't talk about that? So I, I, I don't understand. I have patients that come in to see me that are overweight, and I have some that I've been working with for a long time. I mean, I can think of one particular one, but there's more than one. She walks in the door and I go, um, doesn't look like you lose, lost any weight in the last three months. Yeah, I promised you I was going to. Don't promise me. No weight you lose is gonna help me at all. Mm -hmm. You're promising yourself. And what a lot of these people have said to me, which is sad, is one of the reasons I keep on coming in to see you is because you tell it like it is. I walk in the door and you say, how much weight have you lost? I walk in my doctor's door, and the doctor doesn't say a word. He looks at my labs, says everything's great, I wish everybody else's labs looked like this, thank you David, because that's why my labs look good. <laughs> yeah. you know, but he doesn't say anything about my, my, my weight. You say it immediately. I go, well that's my job, my job is to help you get well, and overweight is part of it. Yeah. And this, this, this bull crap about fat shaming, you know, I don't mean make fun of everybody, no, that's no, not what I'm talking yeah, about. there's no shaming. But, but to, to not, Tell somebody, um, have you ever tried to lose some of the weight for, for your health benefit? You know, say it in a, in a way that isn't being nasty. Yeah. It, it's not about being demeaning. It's about educating and supporting them so that they can feel better and have a better life. Right. You know, yeah. and, and live longer. Yeah. And so it's, 
Yeah, that that's a whole can of worms we could get into. That's, you know, all this PCBS. That's, yes, PCBS. That's a yeah. good way to put it. it. Sounds like a radio station or yeah, TV yeah. station. <laughs> PCBS. Yes. Yeah. Uh, welcome to PCBS. Uh, today, the news is on. <laughs> yeah, but I, and and it's interesting you share about people losing weight, feeling lousy. I haven't experienced that with people I work with. Good. But what I have experienced a lot of is people who can't lose weight. They have, or they get, they lose five pounds, gain five pounds, and they're trying and they're trying and they're trying. And as soon as we start detoxing their body and getting them healthier, because a lot of these chemicals they're full of, they stop the metabolism. They're classified as obesogens. They're obesogens. And endocrine disruptors that are disrupting your hormonal system. And so when you start to cleanse those out and actually detoxify those, they lose 20, 30, 40 pounds doing the same stuff, the same workouts, the same dietary changes that they did oh, less for five in their body. years, right. but now their body is so much healthier that it's now they're able to do, achieve yep. that. So it's it's absolutely, you know, people don't always put the two links together, no, but they're directly no, they related. And like you said, a lot of them are classified as obesogens, yep. and many of the others, if they look into them, they will classify them as obesogens. Yep, yep. Yeah. Neuro po- uh, uh, neurological poisons, yep. Yeah. So... We shared a lot of great stuff, David. One thing I want to close on is in addition to the supplements, you know, which one thing I want to mention on that first off is when it comes to the supplements you recommend mm-hmm. for detoxification, the right. kidney support, the liver support, all of the others that you use, yep. these have no harmful side effects. No. If someone uses them and it's like, I don't know if I need them, we're basically saying you need them. Right. <laughs> and, <laughs> we are basically and, saying that. Yeah. And even if you don't, you know, have full belief that you need them, they're not going to hurt you. There's no, they're not like pharmaceuticals that are going to cause, you know, five more problems as trying to solve one symptom. They're going to have a net positive effect on your overall health. Right. So there's no downside. And, and I always like to add something because people often don't think of this. How many of the people listening to us would um, ask, they're, they're thinking of painting their house. And they don't know anything about the better quality paints and they're wondering. And so uh, the plumber or the electrician is there or their accountant is doing their taxes. And so they ask their accountant or their plumber or their electrician, oh, what's the best paint for my house? And hopefully most of the people listening to me saying this are going, um, why would you ask a plumber, an electrician or a CPA what paint to use? That's the wrong expert. Very good. That's what I want you to understand. Be careful when you ask a question that you seek out somebody who should know that and who you trust in that field. So what do we know for certain, because it's been in the news for 50 years, if not 100, that doctors are not taught in medical school. They are not taught nutrition. Yeah. So if you hear from me you know, or from Ryan or from somebody else that after listening to a bunch of you know, podcasts or recordings of that person, you believe they have the right credentials and they know what they're talking about, that some particular uh, substance, uh, su- supplement, you know, uh, would be good for you. Asking your doctor for their opinion is exactly the same as asking your CPA what brand of paint to use. You're asking the wrong person, and so you deserve everything you get. When your doctor says, "Oh no, that that that's just a, a waste of time," or whatever, and I love it when somebody comes in and says. My doctor looked at my labs. Okay, we've been working together for six months. I hadn't seen him before for six months. He ran the labs you asked for. You took a look at them. We've been doing all the things you want me to do. And I went back in for an appointment. And he's looking at my labs from now and from six months ago. And he or she says, wow, I've never seen labs move in the right direction. Like, this is amazing. You are so much healthier now. What the hell does this, this, this man have you doing? And the person says, well, I'm, I'm taking a good multivitamin that he recommends. I'm taking extra vitamin C. And uh, he's t- he had my vitamin D tested and brought it up where he wants it to be. I'm taking vitamin A. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I've cut out uh, all of the whole grains I was eating before. And I'm eating a lot more fat. I'm eating butter and coconut oil and everything. And very often, the doctor says, oh, my, no, no, you have to stop all those things after just saying that he's never seen everything move in the right direction, when he learns, or she, because a lot of the people I have, their doctors are women, which is great, uh, when they learn what I'm doing, which is opposite to what they weren't taught at all, they go, oh, you have to stop those things, instead of going, oh my God, 
I must have been taught wrong. Yeah. Who is this person? I'd like to learn more and try it with some other patients. That's the proper answer. So be careful about asking doctors about this because I've had doctors tell my patients to stop taking a product. And the doctor has this patient on two drugs which have 25 different side effects. Mm -hmm. In many cases, one of them is death. Some people have died from it. And they're worried about a supplement that has never hurt anybody in the history of the world. So it's really weird that they don't understand how much damage their drugs are doing. Now, if the drug needs to do something with that person, then it's temporarily necessary. And my job, or well, that's what I consider my job is, is to try and help improve their health enough that they won't need that drug anymore. And the doctor will be able to say, wow, your numbers have come down. Let's try stopping this drug. But all drugs are toxic. Drugs are poisons with a use. And sometimes they prescribe them when they shouldn't prescribe them, but the ones that are prescribed you know, correctly, somebody's blood pressure is 180 over 95, and they have to bring it down, okay, fine, but it's still a toxic substance. That doesn't mean that they shouldn't take it, it might not help them, but after we've done what we need to do, and the blood pressure starts coming down, they won't need it anymore. So to listen to the doctor about what they should take, if somebody's working with me for cancer, and I've got them on a bunch of strong antioxidants, high dose vitamin C and A and, and a whole bunch of different things, you know, pycnogenol, whatever. And the doctor says, I want to know what you're taking. I tell my patient, I don't see a, a nutrition credential on your wall. So I'm not going to tell you what I'm getting from my nutrition professional. He is my nutrition professional. He's not going to tell me how to adjust the drugs you're prescribing for me. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the doctors go, I won't work with you if you won't tell me you know, what you're taking. And if they're already working with this doctor and they like him or her, they'll say, fine, they'll give them a list. And the doctor will go, oh my God, no, you can't take vitamin C, you can't take vitamin A, you can't take this, I looked this up, this is also an antioxidant because it will prevent my chemotherapy from working. And the person comes back into my office and they say, I had to stop these three products because the doctor said they will stop their chemotherapy from working. So what I do is I give them a couple of research studies that have been published showing that they don't do that, uh, that they help protect their healthy cells, not the cancer cells, that in many cases, even though we don't know why, they help the chemotherapy kill the cancer better while protecting the healthier cells. And I say, read through these, call me up when you're done, because I won't work with you if you're listening to your doctor about nutrition. I no longer have a purpose. If you're listening to somebody that knows nothing about nutrition, about what nutrition you should take, I have no purpose, so I'm going to kick you out. And they usually read through the studies and go, yeah, I'll go back on them. It's absolutely absurd because even if people hear this from their doctor, who let's just say about supplements, they say, yeah, get off all those supplements, they don't work. They don't say like, can you show me some research demonstrating what you're saying? Have you tried it with other people and seen that they don't work? Have they never you, did. Uh, where are you getting this information from? Because they're just regurgitating things that they've heard in medical school or somewhere else that yep. is just incorrect. And so it's crazy. I had the same exact experience of a cancer patient I'm working with who their oncologist said, this multivitamin, it, you need to stop taking it. It's going to, uh, it's going to work against the chemotherapy. And I'm like, did you say these are just natural vitamins and minerals found in food? Like, do you want me to stop eating too? Like yeah. what? Yeah. I'm getting this same, you know, B complex through the grass fed meat I just ate. Is, right. it, can I not eat meat? Like, <laughs> and so it's just when you start to ask questions, their arguments quickly fall apart. The level of ignorance in the medical profession is so large. I mean, it, it's what made me make up that bumper sticker, which is very, very important for people to understand. Arrogant ignorance a progress-stopping trait of very smart people. Because a lot of the people that are completely ignorant of stuff, their ignorance level is higher if they're very smart because they know they're right even when they're wrong. So it's a progress-stopping trait of very smart people, and it's too bad. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great place to wrap up, David. We've covered some a lot. amazing <laughs> stuff. Yeah. People might need to watch this a second time through because there's a lot of great, great. <laughs> and have your friends watch it. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Share it along to anyone in your life who it can serve. Yep. Uh, in closing, David, uh, I definitely recommend people get a copy of your book because that goes into a lot more depth than we could cover in just sure. one interview. So, yep. Abundant Health 
in a toxic world. You can get it on Amazon. Yep. Um, absolutely fantastic book. I have my copy here. It's all marked up with all my notes <laughs> from reading it. Yep. If, um, you, if you go to my website and you go down to the subscribe area, you won't get a lot of stuff from me. But if there's stuff that's important, you'll get it. And mm-hmm. you can always unsubscribe. Yep. You know, you don't like what you're getting, you can unsubscribe. Definitely sure. recommend yeah. davidgetoff.com. Subscribe to his email list and look into his 10-week course. Uh, it's online. Right. I've taken it. Gosh, probably four or five times now. Yep. It's a fantastic 10-week course called Attaining Optimal Health. And that is something you could access from anywhere in the world. And it is jam-packed with great recommendations on so many things. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. Above yeah. and beyond just detox and diet, it also goes oh, into... lots of different things. Yeah. It's basically every topic you need to know to be healthy. <laughs> attaining Optimal Health. Yeah, yeah. When I first Very started it, I titled it Attaining Optimal Health in the 20th Century. They changed the centuries on me, uh, yeah. and I had to change it to attaining optimal health in the 21st century, and then it's just attaining optimal health. You know, doesn't yeah. need a century. I love it. <laughs> well, thank you for your time, David. It's been a pleasure as always. You're very welcome. <laughs> thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode. If you found it helpful, please share it along to anyone else you believe it can serve. You can find the show notes and resources we discussed at ryankennedyshow.com. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review for the show. Your feedback helps to support me on my mission to positively impact as many people as possible with this information. Much love, everyone.